I'll be presenting my thesis project. Uh, it was entitled Artificial Neural Networks Approach to Competency-Based Training. Um, it was based off another study that was done the year before uh, by NICAN. I think he presented previously uh, on a Friday forum talk. Uh, his, yeah, so he presented that. What he worked on was basically the discectomy portion of the anterior cervical discectomy infusion uh, simulation on the sim ortho. And uh, I worked on the uh, vertebral osteophyte removal component of that uh, simulated operation. So there might be some similarities in the presentation as well as with all the other presentations you've heard on simulation and artificial intelligence, but I'll go ahead with that. Um, maybe I'll just take the questions at the end. So to start off, um, I'll start by saying that the, the background of my study uh, was done as a literary review with over 70 uh, scientific articles. Um, traditionally, uh, surgical training and education has been taught through an apprenticeship model um, in most surgical fields, but due to the constant change in the way surgery is practiced nowadays, the model is becoming more and more limited. And so that's why there's a demand to shift the paradigm of surgical training uh, from this previous model to a more competency-based model. Um, so in order to understand this need for change, um, I'll first go and explain um, why the past models fail the current and future practices. So as some of us might know in the 19th century, Surgeons and physicians would travel all around Europe to the leading hospitals in major cities to learn novel surgical methods and procedures. And in 1890, Dr. Halstead introduced the first residency program where he was the first uh, surgeon in chief at the uh, John Hopkins uh, uh, Hospital in the United States. And this program followed the see one, do one, uh, teach one uh, model and acts as like the pillars of our current residency program that we know today. Uh, nowadays, the residency program, sorry, the residency uh, yeah, program is still using the apprenticeship model, but because of higher concerns of patient safety and the educational expectations from the residents, uh, they're looking at going towards uh, competency-based training. And so as the surgical training pivots towards that competency-based training, uh, more novel simulation technologies are available and trainees are looking for alternative ways of gaining experience. So surgical simulators are becoming increasingly uh, utilized um, for training. Uh, here in this slide, we can see three different um, uh, industries, the avi aviation, military and surgery. And that's because they all have one major commonality the fact that they're all high risk industries. Um, so it's for that reason that in aviation, it's, ex it's expected for pilots to have the knowledge to know how to fly, fly a, pain, a plane, but we also want them to actually being able to fly the plane. Um, in the case of surgery, the thought process is slightly different as the paradigm of surgical training is not fully changed yet. So as we su su suspect, the field of surgery is somewhat behind the airline industry and the military in part due to the late integration of simulation in surgery. Um, as you can see in the top right here, there's a picture of CAE back in 1970s and they're already developing uh, highly technologically advanced uh, simulators. Whereas many years later in 1997, we see this simple laparoscopic simulator that was developed. And so simulation technologies are rapidly growing uh, because there's this shift towards competency-based training, but also because we have a better understanding of the roles of simulation, uh, which are to create a platform that, um, that is standardized, reproducible, and safe, as well as being able to replicate various scenarios in realistic environments uh, for assessment and feedback. Surgical simulation allows trainees to gain uh, different necessary skills such as cognitive, technical, psychomotor, and clinical. Um, simulators can deconstruct complicated 
surgical procedures into manageable steps, allowing learners to focus on specific tasks that require improvement rather than uh, those that have already been mastered. That being said, um, even experienced surgeons could reinforce their acquired skills through uh, repeated practice sessions and allow them to perform in high risk uh, simulated scenarios in a safe environment. Uh, proper uh, surgical simulators should provide educational information, information such as quality uh, assessments of performance and detailed feedback, which are two very important uh, features of uh, a proper simulator. However, it's not all simulators that provide these assessments and feedback. Many simulator-based uh, programs fail to properly integrate these two key um, features. So here we could see that there are multiple types of simulators uh, available nowadays. They vary from low to high fidelity, and this relates to the complexity and the realism of these simulations. Um, if we look first at the, high, uh, the low fidelity simulators, we can see that they include uh, bench models, video box trainers. Uh, these are inexpensive. They're usually easy to build and they're portable. And they also use the real, most of the time they use the real surgical instrumentation. However, uh, these low fidelity simulators provide limited feedback, if any, and they require the presence of a medical instructor or um, just a medical professional to observe and assess surgical performance. Um, an example of this is on the top right, as we can see the FLS, the Fundamentals of Laparoscopic Surgery Box Trainer. Uh, I think we have one in the lab if anyone has visited, but you'd be, you would have had been able to try it there. Um, so this type of simulator it actually fulfills its um, intended role in laparoscopic surgery. But for other types of surgery or, uh, or surgical tasks that may require more, some of them may require more immersive and realistic simulations um, and only a high fidelity simulator could provide that. So when we look at the high fidelity simulators, uh, these include the virtual reality simulators, procedural ones, animal models, and then we also have mannequins, hybrids of mannequins and virtual reality. The major advantages of these high fidelity simulators is that they can combine um, many different operative tasks in order to train for an entire surgical procedure, whereas low, fidel low fidelity simulators uh, focus on one specific task at a time. Uh, also, it's important to note that these high fidelity simulators are often computer-based systems, um, and they allow to compile huge, uh, huge amounts of information uh, and data during the simulation. And so these simulators, um, the simulators like the virtual reality ones allow us to analyze this data and make an unbiased assessment and feedback um, that allow for a more uh, quantitative understanding of uh, the learning progress, uh, yeah, of the learning progression. Um, so that's what we could see here in the bottom right. It's the two simulators that we have in our lab, the NeuroVR and the uh, Sim Ortho by Osimtech. That's the one I uh, had used during my study. I'll be presenting it more in detail in the slides to come. Um, so the field of orthopedic surgery is still relatively new in regards to virtual reality simulation. So far, they don't properly integrate these types of simulators in their training programs. The main challenge in regards to this is the, in regards to the development of uh, orthopedic virtual reality simulators is that they need to respect many different anatomical structures uh, in terms of morphology, as well as the tactile feel. Obviously there's the soft tissues, there's the bones. And so that's a challenge. Um, spine procedures in particular are less common practice in the field of orthopedics and therefore benefit even less from available surgical simulators. We actually, um, during my study, we found this systematic review that investigated uh, existing studies utilizing the VR simulators in spinal procedures. And this revealed only 19 articles in which only five different simulators were mentioned. And so what came out through the this review was that the majority of the simulators, uh, the simulated scenarios on these simulators were often simple operative tasks, which required uh, very few and uh, very few steps. Um, this could be like the l a lumbar puncture, a pedicular screw placement. Uh, 
And um, not all of the simulators were actually virtual reality. A lot of them were augmented reality. And so the augmented reality, they failed to integrate the haptic feedback system, which uh, you'll see through my study and other ones done in the lab, is very important to gather feedback on um, the forces applied on tissues. And so we can conclude through the study, uh, through the systematic review that uh, spinal procedures on virtual reality simulators uh, that include a proper, a proper haptic feedback system. And so the simulator used in my study, as I've mentioned, was the, uh, the, the Sim Ortho by Osimtech. Um, this was developed a couple of years ago. Um, and um, it's because it includes a lot of the features that were necessary that allowed it to, um, to be a spinal um, virtual simulator. Uh, for you, for the ones of you that aren't familiar with uh, this, a virtual reality simulator. It uses a gaming system and 3D glasses to provide very realistic um, visual feedback. It's also equipped with a single five degree of freedom haptic feedback uh, system that, re that replicates the variable applied forces by the instruments interacting with um, the simulated tissues. And it also has auditory feedback, which allows to hear uh, sounds when you're cutting or drilling uh, into different anatomical structures. So by combining, by combining these three uh, means of feedback allowed the sim ortho to be considered a very good candidate for a spine procedure. Um, and that's why they collaborated with the AO Foundation to develop the simulated spine scenario, um, which was the anterior cervical discectomy infusion, the ACDF. Um, and that I'll be presenting a, a video later in, in the presentation uh, during the methods of my study of what that looks like. Um, so aside from the sensory feedback system, we know that virtual reality simulators are built on computer-based systems and they can provide objective assessments of surgical performance as well as um, educational feedback. Uh, these features are possible due to not only the um, the computer, the computer-based systems, but also due to the haptic system that could precisely track the movements, the force applied, uh, the volumes of tissues removed, um, and then generate large data sets um, with that information. And so as we can see here, this is less than a second of data recorded uh, during my study. So if we could imagine a procedure that takes five, uh, 10, 15 minutes, the amount of data that's recorded and that we can use to um, do our objective assessments and give feedback. Um, so th this data, we can use it to create advanced metrics um, that relate to psychomotor skills. The metrics or performance metrics could be defined as standards of reference by which performance efficacy and progress can be assessed. Traditionally, uh, studies would use common statistical methods like t-tests, ANOVAs, um, to analyze metrics by independently comparing uh, specific metrics of individuals at different levels of performance and calculating if there's a significant difference. However, with li um, literature focusing on competency um, and defining it as a multifaceted uh, set of skills resulting in desirable outcomes, assessment of performance should be determined through a combination of metrics rather than analyzing uh, metrics as independ independent features. And so new methods of analyzing metrics should be considered methods like artificial intelligence because of its known compa uh, capacities of processing these large data sets. Uh, in this slide, I'll try to explain uh, to the best of my capabilities, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, while keeping it simple. So it's an advanced, some of you might know, some of you might not really know much about it. Um, to define it, I would say it's an advanced field of computer science that is rapidly growing. And as I mentioned, it could uh, process and analyze large data sets in an attempt to recognize and reveal hidden patterns. It also um, allows itself to, lear to, to learn on its own and make decisions without explicitly being programmed to do so. And therefore, it somehow mimics uh, human intelligence. 
And so, as you can see here, it could be divided into three categories, um, subcategories, which become increasingly stronger uh, in their capabilities. So the first one is the simple classifiers. Uh, these are uh, K nearest neighbor, uh, SVM, decision, decision trees, and they all perform some sort of variant of a similar statistical approach. Then we have the artificial neural networks, which is what I use during my study. Uh, I'll be in the next slide, I'll be presenting this in more uh, details. And finally, we have the deep learning, which is a more so sophisticated type of artificial intelligence. It's um, similar to an ANN, but more complex. Uh, ANNs are referred to as well as shallow neural networks. That's because they have one hidden layer. And deep uh, learning is a network that has two or more hidden layers and becomes increasingly more complex with each new layer added to it. And therefore allowing for stronger decision-making uh, capabilities uh, responsible for subtle decision-making. So here we can see um, the artificial neural network. It's a bit complex to explain, but I have this uh, figure here uh, on the right that could um, allow us to visualize it. As you can see, it, it's composed of three layers of inter interconnected perceptrons. Uh, the perceptrons are all these round nodes that we see. Um, then we can see that there's the input layer. That's the layer where we input our data so in our case here would be the performance metrics uh, that we're inputting. Um, forces uh, average forces applied, velocities, et cetera. Uh, then we have the hidden layer. That's sort of where all the magic happens. And that's where a lot of people kind of get confused and don't really know what, what happens. Uh, later in the presentation, I'll explain a bit more of how that works. And then we have the output layer where um, we output the data in our case, in our case, it's the classification of surgical performance. So either a junior resident, a senior resident or a post resident. Um, and throughout the ANN, weights are assigned between each perception where the magnitude of the weights correspond to the sensitivity of each metric on the algorithm's decision-making process. And so to explain that uh, in with a simple analogy, uh, which I like to use is the this image of uh, rowers in a boat. So as we, can, as we know, some rowers might be stronger, some might be weaker. The stronger rowers um, have more influence on the direction of the boat, and therefore they're represented by metrics with, uh, that have big, uh, larger weights assigned to them. And then we have the weaker rowers, which uh, have less influence on where the boat is gonna go. And therefore those are the metrics that have uh, weights that are much smaller assigned to them. Um, also, if we look carefully in the middle, we can see that there's a rower that's rowing in the opposite direction. Um, that's also because we can see some weights that are negative and therefore they go against the um, specific classification in that case. Uh, another interesting thing to note is just that the artificial neural networks are designed to mimic human intelligence um, by resembling the neuronal architecture of a brain where the perceptions and the weights are intertwined neurons transmitting signals and that uh, influence how neurons communicate uh, with one another. Um, so as I've mentioned, the artificial neural networks provide more of a holistic overview of expertise as opposed to the traditional st statistical methods of differentiating expertise. Um, they do this by analyzing the relationship between different metrics of performance rather than simply assessing uh, metrics individually. And also the artificial neural networks allow for automated classifications of individuals into two or more groups, uh, either predefined groups in our case, which was, it's called the uh, supervised learning. Uh, we could also try to classify uh, without predefining the groups that would be considered um, unsupervised learning and therefore it, the artificial neural network uh, would put people into different groups without uh, having it already uh, programmed to do so. And so the lesser known but uh, more important feature of artificial neural networks uh, can be used to gain important insight in the underlying factors uh, that lead to a specific classification and therefore allowing to have better, a better understanding of the surgical expertise. Um, 
So the goal of my thesis was to utilize uh, artificial neural networks to assess surgical performance of a virtual reality vertebral osteophyte removal and reveal the underlying reasons for uh, the performance classification. Uh, the first objective was to introduce artificial neural networks methodology uh, for assessing the composites of expertise in simulated based training. And the second objective was to outline the utility of the methodology by determining, uh, demonstrating its usefulness um, in outlining um, novel metrics and the contributions of individual metrics to the composites of surgical performance within a virtual reality spinal procedure model. Uh, so here I'm going to start, uh, I'll talk about the methods. Um, they were actually, all the data was done, um, I collected the data from a previous study done by Nicole in the same year as NICAN. Um, her study was to validate the anterior cervical discectomy infusion uh, model on the SIM ortho platform. And so she had 21 participants, which included uh, seven junior residents, five senior residents, and nine post residents, of which five were um, uh, fellows and four were consultants. Um, and what we had them do was we had them perform the surgical procedure. Uh, it was the anterior cervical discectomy infusion. Um, NICAN worked on the discectomy portion of the operation. I worked uh, purely on the third component, which was the vertebral osteophyte removal. Um, and so I have a video here that goes through the whole uh, simulated procedure and explains sort of how the simulator works as well. First, put on the 3D glasses. Multiple tool handles are available to give access to different virtual surgical instruments. Set up the first handle in order to choose the desired instrument. Here, the number 15 sized scalpel is selected. The participant can now make a transverse box cut at the center of the exposed disc annulus, which is the first portion of the simulated ACDF. Once completed, the participant can choose either the pituitary rongeur, disc rongeur, or bone curette to proceed with the second component of the surgical procedure, which is the removal of the vertebral disc. Following this step, the participant switches handles to gain access to the virtual burr that is the default surgical tool of the second handle, and that will be utilized to remove the vertebral osteophyte, which is the portion of the simulated ACDF that is the focus of this study. Finally, once the osteophytes are removed, the participant can either perform the final component of the ACDF with the nerve hook or change the handle one last time in order to use the virtual kerosin to remove the posterior longitudinal ligaments. So that's in brief the uh, simulated ACDF. Um, and so once the participants uh, completed the task, we collected all the data and manipulated it for us to use uh, with, the art with the artificial neural network. Um, here we can see the process of integrating uh, artificial neural networks into virtual reality simulation. Um, it's a simplified way of seeing it. So we first have the participants uh, perform the surgical task. Uh, then we acquire the data, we collect it. Uh, the data looks is usually X, Y, Z coordinates uh, forces applied on different tissues, um, tish, uh, volumes of tissues removed. And so what we do then is we create metrics out of those. So out of the coordinates, we make uh, velocities, accelerations, the forces, we could calculate average forces, max forces. And with all those metrics that we create, we then have a, we perform a feature selection, which allow us to keep only the most relevant um, metrics, which we then take and we use to train the artificial neural network. And so as I mentioned, the art artificial neural network can seem a bit of a black box, especially when we don't understand what's happening uh, within it. Uh, we understand what's going in all the metrics and what's coming out the classifications, but we don't really understand what's happening within it. So uh, 
in my study, we look at that and we try to figure out uh, what's happening and try to understand the underlying reasons for a specific classification to have a better understanding of the surgical expertise. So we open up that black box to look at the artificial neural network. Um, I'll be explaining that soon. So in the results, as you can see, we had um, six metrics. They were all related to um, they were all related to um, safety. Uh, this outlines the importance of um, the role of safety in the osteophyte removal component of the ACDF, uh, but it also shows that it's um, it's consistent with all our other study, most of our other studies uh, in the lab. Uh, NICAN study that worked uh, with the with the discectomy portion also had uh, a lot of safety metrics and highlighted that, as well as all the tumor resection models as well. And so out of these six metrics, we have our average five average forces applied on different anatomical features. And then we have the number of contacts of the active burr on the spinal dura. Um, here we can see how the classification works. Um, so we had the 21 participants, which we separated into two groups. Uh, 15 participants were used to train the artificial neural network and six were used to test it. So as you can see, we achieved 80% accuracy for the testing group and, uh, sorry, for the training group and 83% accuracy for the testing group. That was only one misclassification out of the six individuals. And when we looked deeper into the data, we could see that it was a, surge, a senior resident who I think it was for the um, app average application of force on the C5 vertebra who was, uh, he was applying uh, more, uh, less force than a senior resident would usually apply. And therefore it was more similar to a junior resident. And so the classification of that senior resident was uh, that of a junior resident. And so here I'm gonna explain sort of how we open up that black box. Uh, and gain insight into the underlying factors that lead to a specific classification. Um, it's by calculating the, com uh, the connection weight product, which is the value for each metric of each performance group, allowing to understand the significance of each metric. And so uh, what we do exactly is that we extract all the weights from the artificial neural network and we use the connection weight algorithm by summing the product of each um, input to hidden layer weights, which are represented by the Ws. And then we sum the product of the uh, hidden layer to the output layer weights, which are the Vs here. Uh, and then the relative importance of each metric um, could be calculated just by deriving it from the uh, connection weight products. Here we could see that we have all the connection weight products and the relative importance of each metric according to their performance group. And, um, but I think we'll get a better understanding of these tables if we put it into a bar graph, as you can see here. And so this bar graph uh, was the, a major part of my study. Uh, it allowed us to reveal uh, different hidden learning patterns and define them as well. Um, so the first uh, hidden learning pattern that we found was for the average force on C5 vertebra. Um, and so uh, we defined it as a progressive and sequential change in which learning occurs uh, in incremental stages or follows a certain prescribed order when comparing um, performance as residents progress from a junior to senior and then post-resident level of technical skills. Um, this pattern, as I mentioned, was observed on the C5, the, the metric of the average force applied on the C5 vertebra. It, increasing, it incrementally decreases by comparing uh, the three performance groups. Uh, this continuous learning metric was also prominent in the discectomy component of the, pro of the um, procedure as well that NICAN uh, looked at. And several of our studies from our group have also demonstrated that expertise is associated with decreasing force application. And the findings of this metric are consistent uh, with those results. And so one question that we could ask ourselves uh, looking at this uh, learning pattern is whether a junior resident should be trained to a senior 
level or a post-resident level of force application uh, in the scenario to accelerate the acquisition of uh, surgical expertise. Obviously, if they don't have to go through the intermediate level and go directly to a post-resident level, uh, the process would be much quicker. And so the second uh, learning pattern that we uncovered was the discontinu discontinuous learning pattern. We defined it as uh, variable and non-sequential modification of psychomotor skills learning as residents perform, uh, progress from junior to post-resident level of performance while going through an intermediate uh, senior resident level that performs incongruously. So um, this pattern can be explained if we speculate that junior residents are hesitant when approaching the spinal dura or the left left posterior longitudinal lig ligament with the active burr, while uh, senior residents are more aggressive in, the act in this activity uh, because they have a gain of confidence. Um, however, the post-residents then decrease the force due to their predominance focus on safety. And so once again, we could ask ourselves a question whether the junior residents should be trained to the senior resident level of performance which would potentially uh, be associated with an increased uh, level of risk. Um, it could be interesting if we found some way to uh, bypass that senior resident level, uh, go directly to the post-resident level, and therefore we avoid increasing risk and the learning process would be much quicker. Robin, That's can you just explain a little bit more what, as far as connection with products, <clears throat> why you have like plus one minus one, what, what does this mean? And how, how does that relate to the, the findings? So uh, that's what I was trying to explain a little with the uh, analogy of the, ro the rowers in the boat. So um, if, the, if the connection weight product is negative, that means it goes against the um, certain classification. Therefore, uh, if we use this as an example, the number of uh, contacts with the active burr on the spinal dura, we can see that for the junior residents and the post, uh, the, the, the post, uh, the, um, yeah, so the post resident level as well, um, that they're negative and therefore uh, applying, uh, uh, contacting the uh, spinal dura more would act negatively against uh, their classification for that. And therefore, um, by contacting less, they would be more likely to be classified as a junior resident or as a post-resident. And so for the senior residents who have um, their connection weight product as a positive uh, value, uh, therefore, uh, an individual who would contact the spinal dura here uh, more often would most likely be classified as a senior resident. Um, I don't know if that sort of explains it. Can you go back to the previous slide and just uh, on the continuous learning pattern, maybe do the same thing? Yeah. The same way. So here, once again, this, uh, as we said, the continuous learning pattern is uh, more of like a sequential uh, and it's, um, it's incremental. And therefore, here we could see the forces, uh, the average force applied on the C5 vertebra. So uh, an individual who would apply more force, or should I, yeah, would apply more force would most likely be classified as a junior resident. As we can see that the, uh, the, the CWP is positive and therefore they would most likely be classified as a junior resident. Then we have our senior residents and our post residents where their CWP is negative and therefore um, by having an individual uh, apply less force, they would most likely be classified as either a, a senior resident or a post resident. Uh, however, because the um, values are large, the value is larger for the uh, post residents, it's even more likely for them uh, to be classified as a post-resident uh, when there's even less forces applied. Um, I hope that sort of explains the idea of it. Um, it's a bit hard to explain uh, just like that, but uh, yeah. So that's how 
I would explain it. Um, and that's how we define them as. Uh, one other, there were other patterns that were, um, that were also uh, seen in the study. They're a bit more unusual, um, like the one on the average force applied on the right posterior longitudinal ligament, uh, where the post-resident group is associated with a higher force applied. Uh, this this um, may be the result of uh, instrument positioning or hand ergonomics um, in relationship to the ligament. So we could speculate that the post-residents were more aggressive when trying to complete uh, the removal of the osteophytes um, near the right posterior longitudinal ligament and to that to comp decompress the adjacent cervical nerve. This action requires more risk flexion and the muscle, muscle activation associated with the risk flexion may lead to greater forces applied uh, this was demonstrated in uh, one of the studies from our lab uh, on hand ergonomics. Um, and so that could be an explanation to this. Um, a possible study that we can do uh, to verify that would be, because we had only right-hand participants in the study, uh, would be to try to do the same thing, but with left-hand participants and see if um, that changes um, by using the left-hand participants. And so throughout the discussion of my thesis, I compare the results of my study on the osteophyte removal portion of the ACDF with the ones from the discectomy, uh, discectomy portion that NICAN did. Um, this allowed me to further elaborate on the ed educational utility of ANNs within virtual reality simulation. As you can see, there are quite a few similarities, but it's also interesting to observe the, uh, the few differences that there are. Uh, because the discectomy component could be considered as more complex, allowing for more choices of uh, instruments and tools, um, we can see that there was many more performance metrics revealed for that component of the ACDF. Uh, and those involved um, safety, cognition, efficiency, and motion. Whereas a simpler surgical task, the uh, osteophyte removal of the ACDF, had fewer metrics, only six, and they only involved safety. So what's interesting is that the predominance, once again, of the safety metric for both the components of the simulation is highlighted here. And that means that the methodology still considers operative safety as a critical, um, a critical component of surgical expertise. Um, for the limitations of my study, I divided it into two, um, the limitations related to the artificial neural networks and then the ones related to the study itself. I think it was important to separate them because my study focuses on outlining the educational utility of the ANNs. And so the first limitation of, um, re related to the ANNs is that they're prone to overfitting. Luckily, there's a number of different methods that we could use, uh, consider using um, to solve that. Uh, in our case, I think we reduced the uh, amount of uh, training. Um, I know that the, the algorithm itself had a built-in um, inherently, it was inherently um, fighting against overfitting as well. Um, then, the second limitation was that there was no way of knowing if a better model remains to be discovered as the design of the neural network is established through random trial and error of the hyperparameters. And so when we're deciding how many hit num uh, numbers of hidden layer nodes or other adjustment parameters, it's all by trial and error. So we might get something that works and we might achieve 83% accuracy as we've shown here but there's no way of knowing if there would be a better model um, through, through the random trial and error. And the final one for uh, the limitations related to the artificial neural networks is generalizability, um, which can be a problem. If the artificial neural network is trained on data um, from individuals from one specific institution, as they were in our study, the classification might not perform uh, well and in a generalizable way when it uses uh, individuals from another institution. The, the limitations related to the study now, um, the first one 
was that the sim ortho simulator uh, itself was somewhat limiting because it can't reproduce the complex ever-changing uh, environment of patients undergoing an ACDF. Um, it, lacks, um, it lacks the feature where we can see bleeding and that's a metric that comes out often in a lot of our other studies that use the neuro VR simulator in our lab. Um, there's no option either, uh, options for the burr. We can't uh, vary the speed or the size, and therefore uh, that was limiting a bit. Uh, finally, we, the simulator was designed for right-hand participants, as I've previously mentioned, and therefore we couldn't really use left-handed participants. That relates to the second limitation of the study, which was that we had a small sample size of only 21 participants. Um, and they all came from one institution, as I mentioned. So once again, we can't really assess the generalizability of the model. So to conclude, the study reveals uh, potential, the, the potential of VR simulation combined with artificial neural networks to outline the important composites of surgical expertise, the contributions of each composite, and the interplay of specific composites, uh, which results in expert surgical performance. Um, so thank you all for your attention. Uh, I might be missing a few of the newer members here. I just recycled my previous uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation. So <laughs> the, the members of the lab aren't up to date. But yeah, thank you for your attention.